the National Desk, America's News, now. Setting the stage for the race to the White House. What you need to know before narrowing down your vote. Changing expectations. Why more Americans are putting off getting married. The start of the school year off to a bumpy start. How many districts across the country are facing a bus driver shortage? App apprehension. Why experts say you should think before you click on online shopping marketplace, Timu. And cutting emissions could help you cut costs. The fact check team digs into the president's push for renewable energy. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton, and on this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following this week. President Biden launches his new student loan repayment program, how your monthly payments could be changing. Close calls at airports across the country. New action from the FAA this week to change the course of airline accidents. The search for victims in the Maui fires continues. What we're learning about those who are still unaccounted for. But we begin with the 45th president of the United States officially booked at the Fulton County Jail in Atlanta. The mugshot that got the world's attention and could have a massive impact on the race for the White House former president Donald Trump turned himself in for arrest Thursday, but by Friday morning was already cashing in on it. The charges, though, may be a bit more complicated than his other indictments. The National Desk Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman reports. It is an image that in past political eras would have doomed a candidate. Yet Donald Trump actually fundraising off of it, putting his mugshot on everything from T-shirts to coffee mugs to beer koozies, and boldly proclaiming prosecutors made a mistake by charging him with racketeering crimes. What has taken place here is a travesty of justice. We did nothing wrong. I did nothing wrong. In my book, Get Trump, I predicted all four of these indictments. What I did not predict is a RICO charge because it's so out of the ballpark. While defense attorney Alan Dershowitz says proving the 19 defendants were all conspiring together is tough, he admits prosecutors have one distinct advantage. You can always assume that somebody will turn on a defendant because remember they have so much leverage. They can threaten years and years in prison. But if they don't, he says, RICO charges get trickier. Yet the district attorney confident the evidence is there. Acts of racketeering activity are crimes that are alleged to have been committed in furtherance of the criminal enterprise. Probably the prosecutor's advantage in state court in Georgia is she does have experience with these cases. She's brought them, as you pointed out, against other individuals. This is still an unwieldy prosecution and it's going to be a challenge in the courtroom. Especially as prosecutors initially stated they plan to try all 19 defendants together. Congressman Ken Buck, also a former prosecutor. You know, RICO has to do with organized crime. Um, if this is a crime at all, I think it's a disorganized crime and I don't think these folks are, are willing to testify against the former president of the United States. And all of this could become even more difficult if Trump, like his former chief of staff, requests that his case be moved to a potentially more friendly federal court. Attorneys telling me today that argument alone could go all the way to the Supreme Court. In Washington, Scott Thuman for The National Desk. Scott, thank you. New details on the American nurse who was taken hostage for ransom in Haiti for almost two weeks, breaking her silence, speaking publicly for the first time Alex Dorsonville addressed her kidnappers, telling them she, quote, loves them in Christ and hopes to hug them in heaven one day. Originally from New Hampshire, Dorsonville had been living and working in Haiti with her husband, who you see here. Witnesses told the Associated Press she was working at a local clinic when armed men burst in and kidnapped her and her young daughter in late July. Few details are known about how their August 10th release was arranged. Nearly 400 people are still unaccounted for in Maui after the devastating wildfires earlier this month officials have now released a validated list of names put together by the fbi they hope that it can be used to help identify anyone on the list that is unaccounted for right now we know at least 115 people died making maui the deadliest wildfire disaster in the u.s in more than 100 years 
Keeping an eye on your money, the federal student loan repayment program has officially launched. It's called SAVE and aims to lower payments and reduce overall loan costs for millions of student borrowers. The income-driven plan will calculate payments based on borrowers' income and family size. It'll also forgive remaining balances after a certain number of years. I've said it before and I'll say it again. As long as I'm president, my administration will never stop fighting to deliver relief to borrowers and bring the promise of college to more Americans. And that's a commitment. Student loan payments are set to resume in October. The new program will be fully implemented by next summer. This week, the FAA announced a $121 million investment in airports all across the country to tackle close calls on runways. The National Desk Atra al Nashar shows us how often near collisions are happening. Near disasters happening at U.S. airports far more than we thought. Details highlighted in a preliminary FAA report revealed by the New York Times this week. At least 46 close calls involving commercial airlines last month alone, including a Frontier Airlines plane in San Francisco that was almost hit twice within moments. Encounters the FAA reportedly described as skin to skin. Analyzing FAA records, the Times found these have been happening multiple times a week as a result of human error, often by air traffic controllers, a part of the aviation industry facing a labor shortage. The FAA says it maintains extremely conservative standards for keeping aircraft separated, but acknowledges one close call is too many. Take a look at this FAA video for air traffic controllers that gives a window into what they're dealing with. You've got to develop some sort of a process where you can learn from the data, the close calls. And too often we don't even think about those things because it ended up okay. Back in March, the FAA held a safety summit following initial reports of a series of close calls. Here's what one of the experts who attended told us at the time. A safety organization that is trying to manage the most complex system in the world of aviation uh, cannot plan and plan effectively when there is uncertainty in terms of resources that are available. On Wednesday, the FAA announced $121 million from the bipartisan infrastructure law will be distributed to airports all over the country to upgrade runways and taxiways. Another $100 million was sent out in May. But it's here on Capitol Hill that the backbone of the FAA's funding is still in limbo. Lawmakers have until the end of September before the FAA's current authorization expires. One of the sticking points is whether to make pilot training standards more flexible to fix a pilot shortage also plaguing the industry. Though there are fears that could compromise safety even more. On Capitol Hill, I'm Atrel Nishar for the National Desk, America's News Now. Right now, COVID-19 cases are on the rise. The CDC warns we may see a surge over the coming months. New weekly COVID-related hospitalizations jumping nearly 22% this past week, surpassing more than 12,000. This is the fifth straight week they've increased. Officials are monitoring a new highly mutated variant nicknamed Parola. So far, it's unclear if the variant is the driver, but it's been detected in U.S. wastewater. Ukraine's military may be struggling to break through Russia's defenses because it is too many troops in the wrong places. That's according to a new report from the New York Times citing U.S. officials. They say the main goal of Ukraine's counteroffensive is supposed to be cutting off the so-called land bridge between Russia and Crimea. But commanders aren't dividing their troops correctly in order to do that. The officials also said Ukraine only has about a month before rainy conditions could halt efforts. Timu, it's a budget shopping app and website offering clothes, home goods, pretty much anything you can think of for extremely low prices. This week, the fact check team investigated new concerns over the app's security. Cybersecurity concerns about Chinese owned e commerce company Timu are again drawing attention to TikTok as it works against a potential ban here in the U.S. of national security concerns, of course. I'm with Janae from the Fact Check team. Now, we've seen both sides of the aisle blast TikTok, yeah. accusing the platform and its Chinese linked parent company of collecting and storing personal information of American users. What's TikTok's defense to this? Well, Eugene, the big deal here for a lot of critics is that the Chinese Communist Party could access that information. But TikTok says they have not been asked nor provided such data to the Chinese government. Now, Forbes is reporting a draft of the agreement between the Biden administration and TikTok would provide the American government complete access to TikTok's internal information and, quote, unprecedented control over the app's essential functions. Now, is everyone on board with this proposal as it stands? 
Well, according to Forbes, the Justice and Defense Departments would have the authority to examine TikTok's U.S. facilities, records, equipment, and servers with no notice. Now, this raises censorship concerns, and this agreement could give the U.S. government some of the same types of power that it fears the Chinese government could abuse. Now, we should also note TikTok has not confirmed this draft. Forbes did not provide the draft to the company to protect sources. All right, Janae, thank you. And for more on this fact-check team topic, including links to Janae's sources, you want to scan the QR code on your screen or visit the National Desk.com. Coming up here on the National Desk, America's News Now. Dropping demand, why home buyers are struggling to find a place to call their own. Plus, check-in changes. Which airline is changing how passengers get to choose their seats? Mortgage rates in the U.S. have reached a 22-year high. According to Freddie Mac, the average 30-year fixed-rate mortgage is at more than 7.2 percent. That's up slightly from last week, a 14th of a point. Freddie Mac's chief economist predicts rates will stay at this level or climb higher in the short term due to the strength of the economy. Before last week, rates had not been above 7 percent since November of last year. Meantime, gas prices are down despite growing demand, according to AAA. A gallon of regular gas is down four cents to 382 as of Friday, which is six cents less than the price a year ago. Experts say the drop is mainly due to the overall lower price of oil, now under $80 a barrel, but that could soon change. Labor Day weekend demand could drive gas prices up as people hit the road. The above normal hurricane season could also make gas more expensive if weather forces refineries on the Gulf Coast to shut down. Right now, new concerns of shipping back up in the Panama Canal could cause supply chain disruptions and actually drive up those costs. The National Desk Jan Jeffcoat sat down with former White House economic advisor Steve Moore with more on this week's economic headlines. Commercial ships facing historic delays as they attempt to pass through the Panama Canal. So talk about the effect these delays right now, Steve, are having on the cost of shipping and the global economy. Well, those those delays obviously are going to uh, delay the shipment of goods and services that Americans want and also, you know, international trade. And so the impact of this will be higher prices because this just raises the cost of delivering goods and services. So we'll see how long these delays uh, last. But, you know, the Panama Canal is a major, major route for international trade. Mortgage rates hit their highest level in mm. more than 20 years. The 30-year fixed rate right now is over 7%, Steve. Yep. What's the future, do you think, of the housing market? And, and I mean, what so, do you see the rest yeah. of this year and next year as well? <laughs> well, let's just talk about mortgage rates because you're right. Those have risen about 150% in Biden's presidency. So when Trump left office, we had a mortgage rate of 2.9%. And today the mortgage rate nationally is 7.1%. That's a big, big increase. Yeah. And so, you know, in the last couple of days, we've been trying to uh, measure what that means for a 30 year mortgage. And the best way to think about this is let's say you're buying a more, uh, median um priced home, which is about four hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars, depending on where you live. This these higher mortgage rates, Jan, are going to raise your payments over that 30 year mortgage by about sixty to eighty thousand dollars. <laughs> so this is enormous uh, cost of um, of buying a new house for new homeowners at a time when housing prices have been rising. Mm -hmm. So it's going to put a lot of stress on these 30 and 40 year, year old somethings 
who for the first time are looking for a new home. Uh, so that's that's going to make it tough uh, and expensive. Yeah, no one's going to be able to afford that. So then as a result, <laughs> uh, as a result, what is the future of the housing market? Yeah, so that's a great point. So a rising mortgage rate hurts sellers and buyers. So if you want to sell your home, you're going to probably have to reduce your price because of the higher mortgage rates. And if you're buying a home, you're going to pay more. So this is a definite big negative, Jan, for the housing market. And as you know, housing is a critical, critical feature of the U.S. economy. So we'll see. Let's hope that those interest rates come down. Right. But, you know, the Fed is going to be meeting in a few weeks to decide whether they might raise rates again. Uh, and, and another thing, too, is you have to wonder if this is also going to raise rent prices as a yes. result? The answer is yes, it will. Uh, because, you know, you can, if you have a house, you can either sell it or you can uh, rent it. And you'll have a, a greater demand for people who want to rent a home because they can't afford to buy one. So it's just supply and demand. Exactly. And, <laughs> and you were talking about the interest rates just now. There are economists yeah. who believe they will begin dropping in 2024. I was just looking online this morning to, to see kind of uh -huh. what the predictions are right now. What is your prediction? Uh, boy, that's a tough one to predict. I do think you'll, you might see them rise a little bit more uh, because the, if the Fed raises rates again, I think they'll do one more rate increase, um, then that's going to put more pressure on mortgage rates. Now, I want to assure your viewers, though, when I grew up, Jan, I'm a little older than you are. No, are you ready for no, this? No. Uh, <laughs> are you ready for this? In 1981, do you know what the mortgage interest rate was? I know it was double 16, digits. It was 16 and a half percent. So if you think a 7% mortgage rate is bad, imagine 16%. I, and, and the point there, by the way, is that inflation is one of the major factors right. that drives higher rates. And you can view the full interview plus more top stories online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. New details on check-in changes for travelers flying Southwest Airlines using the early bird option for early boarding. Southwest is the only major U.S. airline where seating is first come, first serve and not assigned. Early bird check-in is now being limited to certain flights and times. The company says the change is part of an overhaul to modernize the customer experience and strengthen its customer base. More Americans are saying, I don't, calling marriage an outdated tradition. The National Desk's Angela Brown explains why wedding bells may be ringing less frequently. The bottom line here, marriage is on the decline. The National Center for Family and Marriage Research found that marriage rates have declined by 60% since 1970. And for young people, attitudes towards marriage is changing. So many reasons why young couples are putting off marriage. Relationship goals changing. People don't need to get married to be in a committed relationship or to have kids. Also, the cost. The average price of a wedding in 2022 $30,000. Costs and changing expectations outweighing tax benefits of getting hitched. There's certainly a legal aspect of it, you know, if you really want that for your tax records. This new thriving center of psychology survey found that two in five young adults view marriage as an outdated tradition. And 85% of young adults say they don't feel marriage is necessary for a fulfilling and committed relationship. But I don't think it's like really that important. Like, you can just stay dating for a while and then like see where life goes. But marriage still the goal for many. That same survey found that 83% of Gen Z and millennials would still like to get married at some point. I think it's something I definitely want. Um, I grew up with two happily married parents, so I feel very fortunate to have that. Um, but it can look different for everybody. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Angela, thank you. Still ahead here on the National Desk, a surge in retail theft in Seattle. The new technology experts say could help connect 911 callers directly with police. Plus, a revolutionary new treatment for patients with chronic back pain. How it works and where you could receive the therapy.
The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America. And we start in Washington, where police are investigating after yet another Seattle pot shop burglary. Captured on camera, another pot shop targeted another vehicle used to get inside. The Kia rams the storefront four times to get inside urban elements in Lake City. It's unfortunate, but it's one of those things that's not so shocking, but it is. Store manager Alexandria Mung said, sadly, it's something you wait for in the cannabis industry. And this store takes precautions. It's spelled out on signs. Even the bollard post didn't prevent it. I'm not surprised by this incident. Um, thieves are getting more and more brazen. Mark Johnson with the Washington Retail Association says it's out of control and deflating when a barrier doesn't stop a burglary. He says the majority of retail theft in our state is linked to organized crime. And last year, retail theft tallied $2.7 billion in losses. What can be done to, to, to stem the tide here? He thinks technology will play a major role, something called rapid video response. It's an emerging technology that allows 911 callers to be connected to a police officer through a virtual platform. San Antonio is using it. Johnson said the Retail Industrial Leaders Association just selected Seattle and King County to be part of a pilot program to test such technologies all in an effort to curb retail thefts nationwide. In Maryland, House Fresh, an air purifier product review blog, has dubbed Mar Baltimore, Maryland, the dirtiest city in America. The site's researchers analyzed millions of sanitation complaints over the last year, and they found Baltimore had more than any other city, totaling more than 47,000. I hope that this help some people outside of government to say, hey, let's go and do some community cleanups. Let's go and clean our block, and let's not be number one on this list. Sacramento occupies the second spot on the list with about 34,000 complaints, still trailing Baltimore by 13,000. And the University of Alabama at Birmingham Hospital is offering a new form of spinal cord stimulation therapy. The treatment involves using a small spinal cord stimulator to send electrical impulses to the spinal cord to ease back pain. While this kind of therapy has been around since the 60s, UAB says the new version can regulate the amount of stimulation applied to a patient to make the treatment as effective as possible. If they don't receive enough electricity, they're not getting adequate pain relief. And then if they get overstimulated, they may get uncomfortable with the stimulation. And so ultimately, they start using their stimulator less. UAB says its hospital is the first in the state to receive the new treatment. It will only be available to those who have experienced chronic back pain for at least six months. Coming up here on the National Desk, could a change in leadership mean another name change for the Washington Commanders? Why the leader of a Native American group is pushing to reverse the decision. Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now, the Los Angeles Lakers say they are planning to unveil a statue of Kobe Bryant outside their arena on February 8th. The basketball legend and his daughter died in a helicopter crash in January 2020. A scuba diver came to the rescue at Millerton Lake in California after a man lost his prosthetic arm while jet skiing. After searching the bottom of the lake, the diver was able to retrieve the prosthetic, giving the man back his mobility. Wow. And check your freezer. Kroger and Food Lion are recalling bags of super sweet cut corn and mixed vegetables sold nationwide over listeria concerns. Those stories and much more available right now at thenationaldesk.com.
Right now, a rare mosquito-borne disease is being blamed in the death of a person in Alabama. The death is one of two cases of eastern equine encephalitis reported in the state. It's spread by bites from infected mosquitoes. According to the CDC, most people don't develop symptoms, but those that do could experience fever, chills, vomiting, and even brain swelling, which can lead to death. About 11 human cases are reported each year in the U.S. And to prevent mosquito bites, the CDC recommends wearing bug spray and clothes that provide coverage. Ahead in our next half hour, death penalty debates how the possible sentence for the alleged architect of the 9-11 attacks could be changing. Plus, all eyes on the economy, how the country's standing could affect which voters head to the polls. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. Is there a disconnect? I think so. Feeling the pinch from the grocery store to the gas station, high prices persist. How the issue is shaping the 2024 race for the White House. Plus the dangerous products for infants on Facebook. How lawmakers are stepping in to help curb the sales. And later on, transportation troubles. The number of U.S. schools dealing with a bus driver shortage just as a new year begins. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton, and more than a year after signing the Inflation Reduction Act into law, President Biden's economic plan seemed to be missing the mark for some voters. Ipsos Consumer Tracker data they collected last week and it shows four in five Americans say they're paying higher prices for gas and groceries than they did this time last year. Those living in rural or suburban parts of the country were more likely to report the impact of inflation than those in urban locations. And those high prices are top of mind for many people. So much so, Democrats are losing support from key voting blocs over economic woes. The National Desk, Janae Bowens, shows us how big of a role this is playing in the upcoming election. 24 presidential. The economy front and center at Wednesday's Republican presidential debate. They need to stop the spending. They need to stop the borrowing. Joe Biden's Bidenomics has led to the loss of $10,000 of spending power for the average family. This at a time when the president is trying to sell Bidenomics. It's working. When we invest in ourselves, when we strengthen the middle class, we see stronger economic growth. But his sales pitch is facing significant headwinds. Many Americans connecting with Oliver Anthony's chart topper, Richmond, north of Richmond, laying out their economic frustrations. I've been selling my soul, working all day, overtime hours for bull 
Pain. A recent poll from Quinnipiac shows 58% of Americans disapprove of President Biden's handling of the economy, including 35% of black voters and 50% of Hispanic voters. Is there a disconnect? I think so. I mean, I, we're obviously seeing numbers that reflect that, you know, black and brown communities are feeling as though they're not they're, they're not feeling the benefits of this economy. But at the end of the day, the numbers are there. Democratic strategist Dallas Jones remains optimistic. Voters will come around when reminded of things like low black unemployment. But in real terms for Americans, as prices are 18 percent higher today than they were before the pandemic and interest rates continue to spike, Republicans see an opening. We must reverse Bidenomics so that middle class families have a chance to succeed again. We cannot succeed as a country if you are working hard and you can't afford groceries a car or a new home. Now we can expect the economy to be a focus at the second debate that goes down on September 27th in California. In Washington, I'm Janae Bowens. Janae, thank you. Developing now, the House Freedom Caucus is making new demands ahead of the September 30th deadline to avoid a government shutdown. The move could throw a wrench in House leaders' plans to pass a temporary funding resolution until Congress can hash out a more permanent agreement. In a statement released earlier this week, the caucus said members would oppose a stopgap funding bill unless it includes specific preferred language on border security. New laws on the so-called weaponization of the Justice Department and the FBI and an end to woke policies at the Pentagon. House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries fired back, stating House Republicans are determined to shut down the government and crash our economy. We will fight these MAGA extremists every step of the way. The House is in recess until September 12th. New details on the trial timeline for accused Idaho killer Brian Koberger, who waived his right to a speedy trial this week. The original October 2nd start date will now be pushed back, but a new date hasn't been set. Koberger is accused of murdering four University of Idaho students and could face the death penalty if convicted. Meantime, the suspected architect of the 9-11 terror attacks and his fellow defendants may never face the death penalty. According to letters obtained by the Associated Press, plea agreements that could remove that possibility are now being considered, but nothing is finalized. The prosecution of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and four other Guantanamo Bay detainees has been delayed repeatedly because of torture they underwent while in CIA custody. After the Washington commanders came under new leadership last month, some fans started pushing to reverse the team's recent name change. The National Desk Jen Jeffco talked with Bill Deakman, a leader from the Native American Guardians Association, about this change. The Redskins dropped the name in 2020 after claims of racism. Your group is pushing to bring it back. Tell me why and, and what efforts you're making to do so. The reason we... Uh are coming forward now. Uh, there's new ownership, which therefore means new opportunity. The name was uh, taken away under false pretense and uh, a lot of inaccuracies, uh, claiming racism and whatnot. Uh, the term redskin is actually a status symbol of a warrior, nothing else. It has nothing to do with eth ethnicity. It's about warriors who were allowed to participate in the blood root ceremony and paint their skin red for battle. Our our fight song even says uh, Braves on the Warpath. And an online petition is asking the Washington commanders to go back to that original team name and, and honor that. Right now it has nearly 150,000 signatures. I was just checking it this morning and counting. It continues. It is one of the most signed petitions on change.org. Tell us the thought process behind launching that petition and why it matters. Uh, a gentleman named uh, Daniel Fazalori uh, started that, and uh, we combined forces with him uh, because it, it's so important to us. Uh, when it was stripped, a lot of us were left devastated and uh, missing a big part of our identity. Uh, Daniel started the petition. We joined forces, jumped in with them, and to see the to see the numbers explode has just been amazing. And to your point, you've done a lot of polls. There are a lot of polls nationally, and you say 90% of Native Americans actually support the name Redskins and are not offended. You were telling us briefly about the history 
Why do you think it got to this point? Because it wasn't until 2020 that, th that the name changed. And a majority of Redskins fans even wanted to keep the name. It was the vocal minority that won in the end. How did that happen? Um, at the risk of offending media, um, the way the media uh, covered it before was just the, for the sensationalism, and they only listened to the 10%. They would skip over nine of me's to talk to one of them. So it's very, very, uh, it's very nice to be able to actually have a voice, and I can't thank you guys enough for giving us that voice. You also say this is not about skin color and that the exactly. imagery is not a mascot. The mascot image was given to the team by the Blackfoot tribe, and you say the narrative that Absolutely. it is racist is all a lie. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's a real man on the side of, I mean, actually, that we're, <laughs> we're the only team that had a, a actual human person uh, that adorned our helmets. Uh, that's Chief to Guns White Calf. Uh, and like you said, gift from the Blackfoot tribe, that was a forever gift. Uh, the fact that it's been given up is beyond devastating and the new ownership says they want to reconnect with native america this is their chance and you can view the full interview plus more top stories online all the time at the national desk.com right now recalled baby products linked to more than 100 infant deaths are still being sold on facebook marketplace members of congress are calling it a serious public safety risk in a letter to meta ceo mark zuckerberg lawmakers said they've sent Thousands of requests from federal regulators to take the listings down. Products listed in the letter include the Fisher-Price Rock and Play, recalled in 2019, and the Boppy Newborn Lounger, recalled in 2021. Lawmakers asking Meta for more information about product safety policies and how it monitors recalls. Developing now a product warning from the FDA. The agency says some companies are selling unapproved treatments for a children's skin condition often referred to as water warts. The FDA has issued a warning to these six companies you're looking at, including Walmart and Amazon, not to sell the products. Right now, there are no FDA approval over the counter treatments for the condition. A new study found that almost half of U.S. carbon emissions come from certain households. The fact check team has a closer look at current policies regulating emissions and a look at a new White House proposal that could change how you get your energy. A new study shows almost half of U.S. emissions comes from the wealthiest households. I'm with Janae from the Fact Check team. Some current policies aim to cut emissions. Give us the facts. Well, Eugene, there's been this uproar from conservatives over things like gas stoves, dishwashers, air conditioners, and other appliances. Now, there's no federal policy to ban gas stoves, but we have seen this type of measure in places like Maryland and California. Now, there are new federal standards for dishwashers and window air conditioners. The Biden administration says this will reduce emissions and cut costs for consumers. And the president is pushing for a carbon pollution free power sector by 2035 but yeah. critics say that's too fast why is that right so the biggest concern is that people across the country could be in the dark now experts at the competitive enterprise institute say the problem with wind and solar as main sources of energy is that the sun does not shine and the wind does not blow all the time which means no power but energy advocates say renewable energy can work we just need to strategically plan and get the infrastructure in place all right important to separate fact from fiction uh, Janae, thank Thank you. And for more on this factory team topic, including links to Janae's sources, you want to scan the QR code on your screen or visit thenationaldesk.com. Coming up here on the National Desk, America's News Now. A bus driver shortage where schools are still struggling to fill vacancies, creating a chaotic start to the new year. And welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. The Bureau's correspondents are here with their insights on the stories they've been covering. Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman, you're in Milwaukee following the uh, first presidential debate, the Republican presidential debate, there this past week. What are your big takeaways? Yeah, at the airport as we speak, Steve, uh, the big takeaway is that you had uh, former President Trump gamble by not attending. And as of now, 
it appears that it paid off. He got big numbers online, and uh, he didn't have to stand up there and be a punching bag for everyone who was probably chomping at the bit for the most part to go after him. He has his supporters, though, including Vivek Ramaswamy, who was not going to do that and said he's been supporting uh, the former president. And he really seemed to take to that spotlight quite well, even though he was attacking many of the other candidates on stage. He got him a lot of airtime. He got a lot of attention. And uh, while they didn't take kindly to it, it certainly got some buzz online and with viewers could get him some more donors, some more supporters and help him move on to the next phase of this race. Uh, the man who a lot of people thought was going to take up that helm was Governor Ron DeSantis. Um, and people believe he fell flat, that there was a real chance for him to step up and say, I'm definitively number two, not just in the polls, but should be in your minds as well. Um, so he may have some rebounding to do, and that's what they do now. They hop out of a place like Wisconsin and they go to Iowa or South Carolina or um, you know New Hampshire and they try and get some more momentum based off what happened in Milwaukee. I think that there were some winners and losers definitively, but none of them uh, seemed to be too dissuaded. I talked to Tim Scott, uh, Senator Tim Scott, right after the debate, uh, and he said, we're just going to keep plugging along. We've got a good message, but it takes time to gain traction. Yep, and a lot of anticipation for the uh, next polls to come out to see if anybody has uh, changed the dynamic in the race. Uh, National correspondent Christine Frizzow, Trump surrendered to authorities in Georgia. Uh, following his fourth indictment. What's next for the former president legally? You know, legally, this landscape is so uncertain right now, Steve. It's very interesting. So on the same day he surrendered at the Fulton County Jail in Atlanta, we saw a few interesting things happen. First of all, District Attorney Fonnie Willis filed a motion to set the court date for this trial to be October 23rd. That is less than two months away. We also saw former President Trump replace his top attorney in the case. So it's going to be interesting to see. We are also going to be watching another aspect of the legal arguments here, which is people who say that if Trump is convicted in this case, that he should be constitutionally ineligible to become president. They're citing Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which takes aim at anyone who's taken part in an insurrection or rebellion, which says that they should not be allowed to be president. So, um, you know, Trump's defenders say that's nonsense. We're going to be seeing what happens. The bottom line here, this is uncharted territory. Uh, so, a lot of questions as to what's going to happen in the coming weeks. Right, and proving that even though there are eight other uh, Republicans on stage this past week at a debate, Donald Trump's still going to be uh, on the front burner in terms of the discussion. Meanwhile, residents of Maui are still recovering from devastating wildfires. A couple of weeks ago, national correspondent Kayla Gaskins, there's been some political fallout for President Biden and other government officials. Tell us about that. Well, Steve, this wildfire in Maui is turning out to be the worst U.S. wildfire in more than a century. There's more than 100 confirmed dead and 1,000 people still missing. And where Biden is getting a lot of criticism is his silence last week. For five days, the president refused to answer any questions on the Maui wildfires. And that really upset some people, especially the residents of Maui. So when President Biden finally made his way to the island this week, he was met with some pretty disgruntled Maui residents who had some Plus the nice things that I can't say on air uh, to, to greet the president. And then Biden had another misstep when he was meeting with survivors, making an attempt to connect with them. But comparing the Maui fire to a small kitchen fire that uh, he ex his vacation home in New Hampshire, where he says he almost lost his Corvette and his cat. So you can imagine why that would upset some people when their entire community has been destroyed. But Biden's not the only one getting criticized here. FEMA now under microscope as well as they ask for more federal dollars to handle this disaster. When reports are coming out that uh, FEMA, the FEMA workers on the ground are actually staying in five star resorts. This is Maui and these resorts go for a thousand dollars a night. We're not exactly sure what rate FEMA is getting, but the fact that they're asking more money and staying in these luxurious circumstances is definitely raising some questions there, Steve. Washington Bureau correspondents Kayla Gaskins, Christine Frizzow, Scott Thuman, thank you all for your hard work and your great reporting. Back to you. Thank you. And right now, the new school year is off to a bumpy start for some districts as the nationwide labor shortage has left some students waiting at the bus stop. The National Desk Angela Brown explains. 
And the school bus driver shortage may be getting worse. A USA Today analysis of all 50 states found at least one major case of a school bus driver shortage. Our reporters across the country are tracking the shortage where they live. Parents brace for a possible repeat of last year. School bus driver shortages, students waiting. A lot of the times the bus never showed up and they were like, oh, sorry, we just didn't have a bus driver. It didn't show, the person didn't show up. Hop, skip, drive. Survey data previewed by USA Today suggests driver shortages have actually gotten worse over the past few years. 92% of leaders surveyed report their operations are constrained by the driver shortages compared with 88% last year. Columbus City Schools facing a shortage. We need about 147 more drivers to be into our ideal situation. A shortage of school bus drivers is a persistent problem, raising pay, not moving the needle. Sometimes people are looking for more flexibility. Sometimes it's the pay, uh, maybe benefits. But um, I think there's also a lot of competition right now. There's shortage of, of workers as a whole, right? And so all industry is competing against each other for people. Some states are getting creative. The governor of Wisconsin recently signing a bill allowing school board members to volunteer as school bus drivers. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Stella had here an officer involved shooting caught on camera in Fresno. The alarming item confiscated from the suspect police say they'd never seen before. Plus a caring community, how a unique clubhouse in Cincinnati is helping members with their mental health. This is the National Desk America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhood covering issues that matter to you. From Texans escaping the heat underground to a unique Ohio club helping its community. We're taking the pulse of America, but we start with the challenges officers face as California police release body cam video of a shooting. <laughs> The Fresno Police Department released this body cam footage of an officer involved shooting involving a teenager. It happened on July 30th. Possibly armed with a handgun. The officer saw the teen wearing a ski mask and ordered him to raise his hands and get down on his knees. He listens. The officer continues to ask the 15 year old to put his hands up. Get your hands up. Stop. Stop. The teen reaches for what appears to be a gun in his waistband. The officer then fires his gun at the teen. Police say the teen was released to his guardian after he was treated in the hospital for his injuries. This was the gun he pulled out. It turned out to be a replica of a Glock semi-automatic handgun. It even had all the Glock stampings. What I can tell you is that I didn't know that companies made replica BB guns. It was a, a, a copyright infringement to actually have the Glock logo. And apparently Glock has given them the, the ability to do that or the authorization to do that. Personally, I, I, I feel they should be illegal. So, so you're selling something that looks just as real as my gun for juveniles to carry around? With our unrelenting streak of triple-digit days, there's a steady stream of visitors heading to Georgetown. You have a guy, guy? Attendance is up with a thousand people a day finding relief 70 feet below the surface. You can definitely tell the temperature drop once you get down through the tunnel. It drops about, I don't know, I would say about 20, 30 degrees it feels like. 72 degrees year-round, so it doesn't matter when you come. You come in the middle of the winter or in the summer, it's still 72 degrees. Inner space cavern. Limestone is an insulator, so the annual average ground temp is the cave's temperature. Even though we're in a drought, 
we still have dripping water in the cave. Doesn't matter how much rain there's been, there's always gonna be water dripping in the cave. Cool thoughts while we wait for a cool change. Uh, do we have a fall in Texas? I mean, I don't know. I see myself grow a lot in my mental health. It's definitely been an amazing experience. Queen City Clubhouse opened one year ago with no members. Now the club has more than 200, serving between 30 to 40 people a day and growing quickly. There are more than 300 clubhouses across the world in 32 different countries. This is going to be a staple in the Cincinnati community. The clubhouse is completely run by its members, offering a variety of activities daily, which members help organize and plan. We've had members that have started groups. We have a member who started a food pantry. We have members who have reached out and gotten donations to lead us to be able to do raffles to raise money. It helped me get along with everybody. They just like a family to me down here. When I'm not here, they ask me where I've been at. I love it. Still ahead here, the story's making headlines next week. The 60th anniversary of one of the most famous speeches in history. Plus, how you can see the biggest and brightest moon of the year. Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, Monday is the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington and Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. It's estimated more than 200,000 people witnessed the 16-minute address on the National Mall. On Thursday, the man accused of shooting Kansas City teen Ralph Yarl is expected in court. Yarl was shot after ringing the wrong doorbell while trying to pick up his siblings. Also next week, the biggest and brightest moon of the year will be visible on August 30th. The best time to view the super blue moon is just after 7.30 p.m. local time on both the east and west coasts. Before we go, take a look at this. A rare giraffe born at a Tennessee zoo nearly a month ago is making headlines because she's literally spotless. Just want to look at her. The Bright Zoo in Limestone believes she's the only giraffe in the world that looks like this. The unique baby giraffe still needs a name, and you can vote for your favorite on the zoo's Facebook page. Zoo officials hope all the attention will help conservation efforts. And that's going to do it for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time. Check your local listings, and you can also watch us online. And catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of The National Desk. I'm Dee Dee Gatton, and from all of us here, have a great week.